Hello everyone and welcome back to English with Kaylee. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at another one of Jackie Kay's poetry uh, which is included in the Cambridge CAIE A-level syllabus um, and the poem we're going to take a look at today is He told us he wanted a black coffin. Um, so first of all I'm just going to read through the poem. It is quite important to note that this one has actually already come up um, in the Cambridge exams um, so, I mean, we could deduce or deduct that, you know, it's unlikely it will come up in the near future, considering we have so many other poems that they can choose from. But, of course, it's still good to prepare yourself um, <clears throat> just in case. So, he told us he wanted a black coffin. And this is for Margaret McAllister. I phoned up the funeral director. He said it would cost us a fortune. So we bought an ordinary pine one painted it black matte like his furniture. It looked smashing. He went out like Charles René Mackintosh, a single bunch of white lilies on top, none but Derek's flowers. These past few days, I can't stop thinking how I wanted to take the abscess out of his five-year-old mouth and put it in mine. I wanted to fall off that wall in Greg Street, the day I swore at Mrs. Calder for calling my son a puff in front of hers. I always knew from when he was 13 and he cried when Gavin moved to Aberdeen. No morphine, no morphine, no morphine. I want to be alive when I'm alive, dead when I'm dead. Know what I mean? No first aid box to fetch, no oil of clothes, no germaline, nothing, nothing his hand in mine, his thumb tap, tapping my palm, me saying, you're all right, son. Everything is all messed up, the boy careening down the hill in the park, his sledge, a huge pair of wings, scarf flying, the man in my kitchen laughing at my bad jokes, who laugh now? The man in the hospital bed, the size of the boy, his face a person from Belsom. The song he sang at the school concert, what was it? It doesn't seem that long ago. So a beautiful poem there from Jackie Kay. And now we're going to look at it uh, stanza by stanza and, and talking a little bit about the analysis. So the first thing you'll see is an image there. Um, this image is of Charles René Mackintosh, who's mentioned in the first stanza. So as we work through, once I get to that section, I'll talk, you, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the man that's mentioned. So first of all, we see he told us he wanted a black coffin. Now, um, this particular poem is from Jackie Kay's Severe Gale 8 collection, which is actually um, located at the back of the adoption papers. Uh, and, and through some research here, we can see that this is a dramatic monologue um, uh, spoken as a mother who loses her son to AIDS. Um, this is a very much a social commentary on the UK in the 1970s and 1980s, as are all of Kay's works uh, within Sylvia Gale 8. Um, and reading her other poetry, which is included in the same collection, for example, Dressing Up, which looks at uh, different themes and different topics about uh, cross-dressing and um, transgender and all these different topics that come up. Um, we're able to deduce her message throughout the poem. Um, so it says here it was for Margaret McAllister. Um, she is an author. I couldn't find a link. Um, I tried to look up some information about her and her family, um, but it was very limited. So if anybody does know anything or has found a, an article um, or a newspaper, you know, clipping, um, it would be very useful to share it with us in the comments. So we have this, I phone up the funeral director. He said it would cost us a fortune. We've got this, you know, demotic language here. So uh, very much an ordinary language. Um, and we can obviously tell that the, the speaker is of a working class family um, with the fact that purchasing a coffin would be extremely expensive. Um, <clears throat> sorry. 
So we bought an ordinary pine one, painted it black matte like his furniture. And then we have, it looked smashing. Now, of course, smashing here, we've got kind of authentic dialect coming in here. Um, another way of saying it looked amazing, it looked great. Um, and we see a, little, a lot of pride here from the speaker. And I feel as if it's almost reflective of her pride for her son um, and what he stood for and, and who he was. You know, as we find out throughout the poem, uh, the mother has always been very supportive of her son. Um, and, and, you know, his life choices. Um, so it, it almost is reflective um, of, of what she's done for him, but also how she feels about him. And again, um, we have this, you know, euphemistic uh, expression to explain the passing of her son. He went out. Um, and, and it's almost here as if it's, you know, expectedly. Like, it, she knew it was coming, um, and of course, that that's referenced through, you know, the disease and, and how quickly it took a hold of her son um, and the phys you know, his deterioration quite rapidly, as we see later on in the poem. So it's quite expected uh, for the speaker. But of course, she still speaks about him with with love and care. Um, and that's where this euphemistic expression um, emphasizes and points out that that kind of love. And then we've got like Charles René Mackintosh. Um, and as I said, that's a picture of him just there. Uh, so he was an artist and an architect. Um, and, you know, he's very much known as, as the image of, of Glasgow style. Um, so a very, very stylish man um, who, quite interestingly, with the thing, with the theme of white lilies on top, he painted a beautiful picture of white tulips, um, which is one of his more famous works. Um, <clears throat> but these floral designs often come up in his work. Interestingly, he died of throat cancer. And obviously in the next stanza, we hear about an abscess in, in her son's throat. Um, obviously, this was back when he was five years old. But we're led to believe there may be some link um, in terms of he went out like Charles René Mackintosh. So it could mean, you know, being stylish and going out, you know, um, in a black coffin, a little bit different. Um, but it could also have reference to, you know, one of the symptoms or one of the diagnoses that her son had. A single bunch of white lilies on top, none but Derek's flowers. <clears throat> so here, um, you know, obviously this person is given importance by being, you know, named using, um, using their first name. Uh, so we have some questions here. It's a little bit ambiguous about who it is, but we could maybe question or suggest that it is the man's lover. Then we move on to the second stanza. These past few days, I can't stop thinking how I wanted to take the abscess out of his five-year-old mouth and put it in mine. Um, <clears throat> so here, these past few days, I can't stop thinking. So in, in the first stanza, we almost see someone who is, is very matter of fact. Um, this often happens. It, it's almost a process of grief. When you lose someone and you're in charge of preparing for the funeral, um, often people will kind of put themselves into a mindset of just going through the motions. And then it's not until after that point that they can actually grieve the loss. Um, and we see these memories coming through. How I wanted to take the abscess out of his five-year-old mouth and put it in mine. So again, we've got this kind of similar idea to the Macintosh with the with throat cancer. Again, possibly foreshadowing or you know lending itself to the idea of one of the symptoms or one of the problems that the man had in later life before he died. And we see this clearly here that the mother wants to take on his suffering. He, you know, he wants she wants to remove it from the child and endure it herself um, and again possibly foreshadowing and also reflecting the idea that she wishes she could have taken that pain away from her son even at a later stage in his life um, and, and then we see something quite different for the personality of the speaker so far we've seen someone who's very caring and you know doesn't seem very confrontational she seems very supportive 
but here we have the day I swore at Mrs. Calder. Um, so we see her protective nature coming through here as a mother, um, which is you know very very typically characteristic of Kay's poetry. We often see these you know these parental relationships and the mother acting very protective. Especially um, we could mention teeth, you know, um, in which the woman is talking about uh, you know the attack of her daughter. Um, so the day I swore at Mrs. Carla for calling my son a puff in front of hers. Now, obviously, a puff is a very, you know, it has a very vulgar denotation to it. It creates a very tense atmosphere. And I feel as if this is where the social commentary is coming in. Um, obviously, for Kay growing up as a, a, not only a, a black woman in Scotland, but also as a, as a lesbian, um, this is possibly, and, and she has stated something that, you know, she was um, a victim of um, homophobia. And, and especially with this bit in front of hers, it almost adds to that layer of embarrassment for the child. And so the mother feels very, very protective. And then we have, you know, the revelation of, of the mother always knew about her son and his sexuality. I always knew from when he was 13 and he cried when Gavin moved to Aberdeen. So here we get this instant connection between the parent and the child that, you know, even without the verbal confirmation of it, she knows her child very well. Um, and, and we've got this lovely little couplet, the rhyming couplet, 13 Aberdeen. Um, so this is obviously the revelation <clears throat> and the, you know, the discovery that her son is, is gay. And we see this, the rhyming couplet here really marries the sentence together to really highlight the mother's acceptance. Um, she doesn't see it something that's odd or out of place. She really supports him um, in his decisions. And, and we just see this great love and care for her child. So this is the section here where we see memories coming through and starting to take a hold. But a lot of the memories here, especially when they encapsulate and they include other people, there's a lot of anger coming through, which of course we know is one of the stages of grief, you know, where you feel angry about what's happened. And we see that anger coming through here. Then we move on to the next stanza, the third stanza. And actually this isn't very typical of Kay. It is very typical of her to embed other speakers and, and their voice. Um, but what is strange here is that usually she uses italics when using, you know, authentic speech. Um, but here we see uh, the son's voice coming through. And he says, no morphine, no morphine, no foot morphine. I want to be alive when I'm alive, dead when I'm dead. Know what I mean? So here, you know, we have this, this outright refusal of, of pain relief and, and this lack of punctuation almost suggests that, you know, this is non-negotiable. There's no gap or no time for anyone to, to discuss this with him or to come back with a counter argument. He is, you know, he's very definitive in his decisions. Um, and very, very interestingly, you know, we, we get the sense he knows he's coming to the end. Um, but in the moments when he is alive, he wants to stay positive and he wants to remain as, as close to himself as he possibly can. The real him, not, a, you know, not a, not a version of him that's been changed by all the medicine. Um, which I think speaks greatly to the idea of, of identity, um, especially with David Paddy. Um, <clears throat> and now we go back to, to the mother's uh, feelings and the mother's experience. No first aid box to fetch, no oil of clothes, no germaline. Um, now, these are items that we use to heal childhood in, um, injuries. I know for me, um, I'm from the UK, and when I saw germaline, this is um, an ointment, a cream that my mum would use uh, when, when me and my, you know, my siblings were younger, if we got a cut or we got a graze. Um, so here, this really highlights the, the, the kind of helplessness and, and how useless the, the mother feels that there's nothing she can do 
to, to ease his pain. Um, and then we get this nothing, nothing, just total helplessness, this repetition that this, you know, she has nothing she can do, nothing she can offer him but her love and support as he comes to the end of his life. His hand in mine, his thumb tap tapping my palm. We've got this beautiful consonants coming through here, almost mimicking that tapping sound um, of him almost, you know, uh, tr trying to hold her hand <clears throat> and me saying, you're all right, son. So we see this kind of small sign of life in the movement of the hand, um, again, showing the, the level of weakness of, of the son. And, and the mother's almost masked optimism, you know, me saying, you, you, you're all right. Very much juxtaposed, juxtaposed, very much juxtaposed within the next sentence of, of the final stanza, where she says, everything is all messed up. So here we definitely see the juxtaposition of the previous line. When speaking to her son, um, she still takes on that mothering role of, of you know, protection and, and trying to look on the bright side and trying to remain positive. Um, and then we go back, uh, and, and I think that this really shows, you know, that, that her, her resolution to grief or as she moves to the next stage, which really looks at the positive memories of her son. And I think everyone can agree that when you lose somebody, what you hope you're left with are those positive memories. So here we have the boy careening down the hill in the park. His sledge, a huge pair of wings, scarf flying. The man in my kitchen laughing at my bad jokes. Who laugh now? Um, so here we also see this, uh, this juxtaposing idea of a huge pair of wings. So when he was young and he was very free, and now it's juxtaposed with the man who's lying in the hospital bed. Um, but, but very much trying to hold on to those positive memories and experiences that she had with her son. Then we have his face, a person from Belson. Um, and, and of course, this is quite a heart rendering comparison um, because Belson was one of the concentration camps in the war. Uh, and it also really serves as, as quite shocking imagery to show the rapid physical deterioration of the man as he's lying in hospital. And then we go back to that kind of more positive idea and the more positive memory of the song he sang at the school concert. What was it? It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem that long ago. Um, there's no resolution to, to the poem. And, and I think that's something worth commenting on in that grief is, is a process uh, and, and for this woman and for the mother, um, the voice in the poem, she is of course going through those stages of grief. And as we know, it, it's not resolute um, and it's not something that kind of neatly wraps up. There's a lot of conflicting feelings. There's a lot of anger, you know, there's a lot of upset. And then, but there's also those, those positive moments of, of happy memories with her son. Now, in terms of AO5, um, Gabrielle Griffin um, wrote an article, wrote a journal entry from mourning to militancy. And this is about HIV and AIDS and Jackie Kay's poetry. Although AIDS, um, we, we do see some reference to it, with the example in Love Nest, one of Jackie Kay's other poems within the collection that is tested for A level. But in several of her other poems, we get a much clearer idea that she's speaking about HIV and AIDS. Um, in 1989, when cultural critic and activist Douglas Crimp published his seminal article of, um, on the politics of AIDS activism and of mourning, HIV and AIDS had begun to take hold in the, you know, the social imagery and imaginary of Western society as a deadly disease affecting in particular gay men who were dying in vast numbers. 
in certain centres, uh, certain urban centres of the US as well as in Western countries. Um, and, and she summarises very nicely here that he told us he wanted a black coffin. Um, this shows a mother of a man who's died from AIDS, an AIDS-related illness, um, and that she's trying to remember the past as they're, you know, suspended in their grief for a future no longer to be had. Um, and, and of course, as I said, David Paddy would be an excellent one to reference as well in terms of identity um, and how it's shaped by the things that happen in society. Uh, so I hope this video has been helpful for you. Please don't forget to like and subscribe for more Jackie Kay poetry um, and more literature in general. Uh, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye, guys.